Hi, Pi Texas. I am Paul Bailey, and I'm going to be talking about building a sensor network with LoRaWAN and Python. I'm the Pizza Panther on Twitter, GitHub, and I'm also in the Pi Texas Slack. Uh, if you have questions, look me up. Before we get started, a little bit about myself. Currently, I'm a systems architect at Cognitive Space, and we do machine learning for satellite vehicle planning and other orbital vehicles. We are hiring right now for an ML engineer and a full stack developer. So look me up in the Pi Texas Slack or on Twitter. Uh, again, that's Pizza Panther and send me a message and we'll get talking. All right, so that's out of the way. Let's talk about LoRa and LoRaWAN. So what is LoRa, first of all? So LoRa, stands for long range, sort of an acronym. And all it is is just a low power radio scheme. So we want to do things like sensors, uh, maybe like a doorbell, things that are gonna have a, you know, be longer range than Wi-Fi. And, you know, these are gonna be small things. So we want the radio scheme to, handle or to be accommodating of low power devices. Uh, because of that though, because we want long range and low power, the downside of that is that we have a low data rate. But LoRa isn't really, you know, this is designed for that. So, you know, we're thinking little sensors, uh, you know, that all over the place, but could potentially be, you know, miles away. So, you know, this protocol, this radio scheme was designed for the Internet of Things. So that's uh, LoRa. LoRaWAN now is the, the protocol that's on top of LoRa. So, you know, LoRa is just about managing the radio frequency and modulation and such. LoRaWAN is kind of like does or is responsible for all the things that we typically see in like a network. So think routing. Uh, security, performance. So like in terms of routing, we could have a sensor out in, let's say, a city parking lot somewhere. Um, in that situation, it may be able to talk to several different gateways, and we'll get into these definitions soon. And so, you know, we, won't, we don't want that sensor data to be duplicated. So LoRaWAN is responsible for deduplicating packets, uh, security, there's encryption protocols built in, uh, performance. We want to make sure you know a certain sensor doesn't overwhelm the network. So LoRaWAN is kind of responsible for all these like low-level things, so that we can just send our packets of data, and it just kind of happens. All right, so let's go a little bit into what a LoRaWAN network looks like and what are some of the things. Uh, we're going to be talking about. So over here on the left, this is the low power devices that we're talking about. So you can see you got a pet tracker, smoke alarm, water meter, all kinds of different things that we might have a sensor on. And these color lines over here on the left, that really represents the, the lower part of it. So, you know, this pet that maybe ran away could be several miles away. When that sensor uh, sends out some data, it's going to send out over the lower WAN frequencies to a gateway. And then this gateway is what's connected to the internet. And then that gateway go ahead, sends that packet to some kind of network server. And this is usually some kind of service that we're using. And we'll, we'll get into some of these here shortly. And then eventually over here on the right, the application server would be like the server that maybe you maintain and you have your database and you're recording a uh, little Fifi and Fufu running away. And so, you know, this might be a web server or, or whatever. So the lower part is, it, is over here on the side, on the left-hand side. But, you know, these are also important pieces too uh, of getting your data to you. And you can see, right, with these lines, again, we talked about deduplication. So this trash container sensor is in range of three gateways, 
but when it comes through the network, we only receive that one, uh, whatever the sensor reading is at that moment. All right, let's go on here. So uh, to go back, this network server portion of it, that's what I'm going to show you next here. So like I said, there's several services that you will have to kind of like shuttle your data through. This could potentially also be uh, an open source. So there's open source gateways that you can shovel your service through. And here's a map of Austin. Uh, one of these networks is called the Things Network. It's, it seems to be uh, a lot more sensors in Europe than there is in the US. But you can see there's quite a few sensors around Austin. So if you're using the Things Network and your sensor is close to one of these, you'll be able to shuttle data from your sensor through the Things Network and then over to your application. And again, we're going to get into uh, if you want. So, you know, the range that we're talking about for these sensors is in kilometers. So not a lot, particularly a lot of sensors here. You could potentially be out of range. So we'll talk about uh, maybe setting up your own gateway here in a little bit. So one of the other networks in the US is the Helium network. And you can see they have quite a few more uh, gateways in Austin. So potentially uh, you could you know, get through their network, uh, you know, with a higher probability. Now, the Helium network is kind of interesting because it's a, like a Wi-Fi router, and then they built the LoRa protocol into it. So they've been, I think they launched last year, they were selling these Wi-Fi routers. So if you look, I don't know if you can see it on this picture, but you'll see like a lot of businesses. So you have these gateways and a lot of businesses they are serving up Wi-Fi, but then also able to ingest uh, sensor data. Uh, I haven't particularly used them. We're going to go over to Things Network. They've been around a little bit longer than Helium has. Uh, Helium just launched this past year. But you can see, though, because of this kind of router scheme that they have, they've grown in the U.S. at least a lot faster. All right, so let's talk about the gateways. So again, you if you have one of these, we'll go back to these pictures here. If you're by one of these points, you could potentially set up a sensor, sign up for this uh, service, Helium service, and your sensor could go through there and it reports back to your application. However, I'm out here in uh, Canyon Lake and so here's my area and the nearest one before I made mine was in Fisher, Texas, but I'm down here. So you can see though, uh, this is my gateway. I wanted to put a, a water temperature sensor in the lake. And so I had nothing for miles and miles. And so I had to build a, build a gateway. So like I said, the range for Laura, uh, you know, it, it actually really highly depends on the sensor that you're building and how much power you want to run through it. But in a city, typically two to three kilometers out in a rural area, if you just have like a big field and a big uh, straight line of sight, you can get five to seven kilometers. Again, if you, if you kind of go past the recommended specs for some of these things, they've had tests go to hundreds of kilometers and someone even tested out a uh, satellite. So they sent up a small satellite and were able to get uh, lower devices to talk to the satellite. Uh, that would be really nice. You know, so out here and at the lake, it's really hilly. So if I don't have a straight line of sight to my antenna, I'm not going to get that signal. But if you have a satellite, you might need more power to get to it, but you always have a straight line of sight at some time of the day whenever it's overhead. So I actually built uh, this rack gateway 
and here's a picture of it. And you can kind of go as expensive or as cheap as you want to go. It just depends how much money you want to spend. Uh, you could go really cheap. The, the really cheap gateways usually only have one channel. And so it's not really like a full size gateway. A gateway like this is still pretty cheap. Uh, I think it was a, I think you can get them for a hundred or 200 bucks um, now, but it has all eight channels that you can use with the gateway. And you can see actually this model additionally. So I believe it's this uh, left-hand top on the left is the Laura antenna. It has a GPS antenna, and then these two bottom ones are actually LTE. So there's an LTE model where you could send data over the internet through a wireless carrier. I just got the Wi-Fi model, so I have mine sitting at my house. And when sensor data comes in, it just transmits it through my Wi-Fi. And this is actually just a Raspberry Pi. So you can buy these, make these on your own. Actually, you could even just buy the pieces individually and put them in a case. That's all this really is. But it's nice to kind of bundle it all together for you. And Helium is even now selling this as one of their gateways. Uh, they gave it some kind of other name. This is the original Helium hotspot over here that includes Laura. But if you buy this gateway on your own, you can run a private Laura gateway server. Um, and then just shuttle the data to your application directly. Or you can install the Things Network and shuttle data through there. Uh, so the nice thing, though, is if you use one of these gateways and you're on the Things or the Helium Network, other people can also send data through. So back to the security of LoRaWAN, uh, the packets, and we'll show you know, how this is set up here shortly, are, are all encrypted. So the idea is that just as long as you're in range of any gateway, you can transmit your data safely to your application in an encrypted manner. So if you're in Canyon Lake and you have a LoRa device, you can go through my gateway and of course, now I have mine hooked up to the Things Network currently. So if you had it hooked up to the Helium Network, it's not going to do much. I don't know. I don't think they have an interconnect, but um, that could possibly happen in the future. But if you're hooked up to the Things Network, you'll be able to transmit data. So, you know, it's an open device. Anyone in the area uh, can send data through. And But like we talked about, the LoRaWAN also has uh, budgets. So, you know, if a sensor is sending too much data through the network, uh, part of the LoRaWAN protocol is budgets so that, you know, it will stop picking up that or stop it going through. So, but for the most part, we don't really have to worry about this because we're talking about low power devices. We're talking about sensors. And it's not like uh, they're sending gigabytes worth of video or anything like that. All right, so that's the gateway. Uh, here's a picture of the sensor I built. So let's talk about the sensors a little bit. So I wanted to go over uh, my build here. And actually, let's, let's look up here. Yeah, the rack gateway. So you can go as, you know, much of this you want to build yourself, you can build it. You can see there's the little uh, rack gateway that we're talking about. But there's also all kinds of uh, sensors already pre-built. So if you don't want to build a sensor, you can go out there and buy some. So like this right here is a home sensor, I think, for weather. So if you wanted a weather sensor, you could just buy this. And if you're you know, close to a gateway, it could start reporting data. Um, I think this one right here is like a GPS. Maybe these two are GPS sensors. So um, what you would do is you could stick this on like a car and track the car. And so it's got a GPS built in. So it tracks, you know, where that car is. And when it's in range of a LoRa gateway, 
it will transmit the location, you know, where the car has been. So that's a couple pre-built. This is just rack. There's actually tons of other sensors pre-built that you can buy and you can just kind of throw up on the network. I, uh, like I said, I wanted to build a temperature sensor for the lake. And so I wanted a, something that I could stick in the water. So you can see down here, there's a big long cable that's like, uh, I think nine feet long that I can stick in the water and is waterproof. And then, you know, I also needed something waterproof for rain so that I could just stick it out there and not have to worry about it. So I went ahead and build mine. Um, you can see it runs on solar uh, power also. So what's inside that box there? Uh, how did I build my sensor? So, and I put some of these down because there's actually a million ways to build these sensors, but it's nice to kind of have a reference and also uh, like this Voltaic Systems battery and solar panel, the battery is specifically designed uh, to be charged with a solar panel. So it can do trickle charging. Solar panels of that size do not produce that much energy. So you need something that can be trickle charged. And also if it runs out, let's say there's a couple days of cloudy weather and my battery runs out, the battery for this, uh, from this Voltaic systems actually will power back on when it gets recharged. So, you know, it waits till like it gets to like 25% and turns back on. So it has special features that are nice, you know, for building a, a sensor like this. I also used uh, a Raspberry Pi Zero. So that's in the box. I use a digital temperature sensor so that that cable with the long temp temperature probe uh, that's this model here that you can see. Uh, I had, so on top of my Raspberry Pi, or I guess uh, soldered to it, I put this model of transceiver. I got most of, I think, these two things from Adafruit. So that's a good place. But I also got some of this stuff off of Amazon. So, uh, you know, look there. And apparently I had a water prof box or a water waterproof box, as most of us would say. <laughs> so that's what was inside. Now you could potentially use, like I said, all kinds of other different parts. The Raspberry Pi Zero is a little bit more power hungry than let's say like um, some of the other smaller boards. But with that said, why I like the Raspberry Pi Zero is it's just plain Linux and I can run Python on it. So it made it very easy. You know, I'm just learning things here and sticking stuff together. So, um, you know, the fact that I could just use Linux and Python, that was a big win for me. And I just kind of, uh, you know, the extra draw of the Raspberry Pi Zero, which isn't very much, but it's enough that for a device like this, you know, the battery, I think, lasts me two days, maybe at the most. So if I don't have a sunny day, you know, like an Arduino would have been better. But, you know, just buy a bigger battery and a bigger solar panel. So I think the Arduino might have been cheaper, too, in terms of some of the other pieces, you know, because I could have made the battery smaller and solar panel smaller. But like I said, I wanted to be able to do Python and just kind of handle Linux as usual. So I bought all these parts, kind of found out what I wanted to do. And at this point, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I'm soldering stuff and I'm not really a hardware person, not very good at soldering. But eventually uh, I was able to figure it out and get something going. I think I blew out maybe uh, one Raspberry Pi Zero. They're only like 10 bucks. I blew out a temperature sensor because I soldered it wrong. And I think I killed a, a transceiver also. So just about all these uh, parts where you had to solder stuff together, I think I, I blew them all out at least once and had to buy an additional one. But eventually I got something working. And so, yeah, let's, let's actually look at like some Python now. So, and this isn't all of my Python. I didn't want to post uh, everything I cut a lot out 
because depending on the sensor you get and the hardware that you're using, this could contain, a, uh, could change a lot. And, uh, but what's really cool though is Adafruit publishes a lot of Python libraries for these devices and a lot of code. So when you buy uh, a sensor of any particular type or a radio of any particular type, uh, look up the Python code and a lot of times Adafruit will have libraries out there that you can use. So this, this piece of code is just reading the temperature. So when you have everything set up and you have to go in and change some settings on the Raspberry Pi and such, but once you have that all set up, it shows up as a file on the file system. And so reading the temperature is basically as easy as reading a file in Python, right? So that's the number of that file changes, but that's the location of, for that particular sensor. So when we get the temperature, uh, let's go down here a little bit. We're just reading that file, stripping away some of the, the uh, you know, spacing and such. And the read raw temp, yeah, you can see it's just reading that file. And it's looking for a line where it says T equals so that that's where the temperature is. I forget what units it is, but I want mine in degrees Fahrenheit. So you have to do some a little bit of uh, math there from high school to convert that temperature. And then we were just return that temperature. So, uh, you know, it's pretty easy. If you can read a file, do a little math, that's how you get your temperature. All right, moving on. All right, so let's talk about sending the data. Now this is the code, the Python code, I didn't really put in because the temperature data uh, from different, or the sensor data from different sensors is pretty consistent and works like that. So that was kind of a nice little example of like showing reading a file, but the different, depending on the transceiver you get, those kind of work differently. Um, so I didn't really want to put that code in there because I don't even know if they sell that particular transceiver anymore. So that changes a lot. You'll have to go look into that. Um, again, Adafruit though published a library for that transceiver that I could use. But what I did want to talk about is once you kind of have that Python code to send the data, you will have to set it up on your network. So whether it's the Helium, the Things Network, or a private gateway that you have to set up. So when you go in, and this is a picture of setting up a device, uh, let's go into my Things Network console here. So first of all, uh, before we talk about setting up the device, you can see here's my gateway. So I set up my gateway and my devices, since they're around my house, talk to this gateway. Um, but then you can also set up applications. So I have my application here, and I have some devices on that application. And so you can see when you register a device, you have to fill out some of this information. These are the different keys that will be used to encrypt traffic uh, for your sensor. And some of these keys, you have to go ahead and put them in the code that you're running so that it can encrypt stuff properly. And you can see this is the demo. I'm gonna do a demo here. I have one already set up. So you can see some of my keys, um, the IDs. So you have to put in these three things right here to be able to talk over the network. So you have to register your device on whichever network you're using. All right, so if you looked at this screenshot, you said it said low stick. So while I was doing this, going through all this whole mess of trying to solder stuff and you know constantly burning myself and burning out boards and stuff, <laughs> I found this little uh, thing. And so this is a cool little device 
if you're just kind of messing around and you just want to send some data through the network, maybe you're not going to have a permanent sensor. Uh, this little low stick thing is really awesome. And I think they make them in batches, so you can't get it on Amazon right now, but they may have it in other places. Uh, hopefully they'll make another batch here soon. But this low stick, let's open that up, is a little USB device, so you can plug it in and they have Python code uh, that you can run and play with, play around with stuff. And since it's a serial device, it makes it really easy to send data over LoRa because you're just doing text commands. So, and we'll see some of those here in a second. And actually what I did, this takes up a little bit more power, but I made a version two of my sensor. I use this instead. <laughs> so instead of having to like solder stuff into the board, I just got a little USB adapter for the Raspberry Pi and made a version two. This takes up more energy for sure, more power, but it was just kind of nice to build it fast and stick this on there and then use a somewhat uh, simpler Python here that we'll see here in a second. And so it comes with examples in the code. We're going to look at this one uh, for our demonstration here. And so uh, I'll show that code off here in a second. So I highly recommend this for testing or even if you want to make you know a device, it's, it works actually pretty great. So here's some of the Python though from the low stick. Um, and this is in, in some of those example files. Again, I just kind of cut out the important part. And so you're just talking over a serial port. So you open that port and then you're sending text commands. So this is where you can see when we looked at uh, my device registration over here, I had an application ID put that in at an application key, put that in and I have a device ID also. And then you say, join the network. So OTAA is a type of network uh, protocol. This is the newer um, encryption scheme. There's actually an older encryption scheme. You could also potentially use that, but this is the newer, more secure version. So probably want to use this this scheme if you want uh, the best security. And then, so once we join the network, we just send the command. So with each packet in LoRa, part of the protocol is you send a counter and the things network, other networks will actually check this counter to make sure it's always increasing. And that way um, it's part of a security check you can turn that security check off too. But, you know, so when you send, let's say the temperature for my water sensor, then I send it once, you know, that's counter number one. I send it again, counter number two, counter number three. So if something ever comes as counter number one again, it's going to reject it. And then, so I send the counter, but then I also transmit some data. And so this is where I'm transmitting some data and I'm sending a data packet. So a lot easier because I just open device again, almost like a file and send some commands through it. So a lot easier to use if you're just playing around with things. Not again, not the best. So if you're trying to make like a really low power uh, device or sensor. All right. So I think I put the picture here. Yeah. So we talked about our sensor over here. We talked about the gateway. You'll build or use a gateway next to you. We talked about the network server. So that was the things network or Helium or your own private gateway. Again, there's open source, there's open source gateway network servers uh, that you can run. So the last part is this, these lines over here. So it comes into the network service now you want to transmit it back to some um, application or database. So with the Things Network, they have several 
integrations. Uh, you can see down here, this is the one I'm going to be using. It's an HTTP integration, but they have uh, several other integrations. So when data comes in, and they even kind of have like a like cloud function type uh, deal, so you could transfer some of the transform some of the data and send it off to one of these uh, integrations. I'm just going to do straight uh, HTTP and send that data over to my server. All right, so now I think it's uh, time for our demo. So let's check this out. All right, so this is, and this is the low stick code straight from uh, that GitHub that I showed off earlier. And I went ahead and just plugged in all of my IDs, hard coded them into the file. Uh, but normally you can run this with command line switches. And so let's start this up. So this is going to simulate my sensor. I'm just sending random integers through um, as data. But this is coming off my low stick. So you can see, all right, it's going to try to join a network. Hopefully it will find my gateway here. And I hasn't found anything yet. All right, so let's look while that's going. So that's going to keep on looping until it can up. Oh, there we go. We got accepted onto the network and we transmitted some data. All right, so let's go over to our things network here. And we got this device and we can look at the data in real time. So that little lower win example from low stick, it just sends, like I said, like an integer over, and then you can see it. So the counter is increasing every time it loops. I think it's like every five seconds here, we'll see a piece of data come through. So uh, back to our picture. So we have our low stick sending data to our gateway. So the, the gateway is in my house, and then that connects via Wi-Fi to the things network. And so we're seeing the data come into the things network here. All right, so what's that last piece though? I actually have this hooked up to the HTTP integration. Now, since this is just random data, we're just gonna see a bunch of errors, but here's my Heroku app. So this is out in the cloud somewhere on AWS and we can see every five seconds, it's hitting my sensors endpoint. And again, this isn't real temperature data. So it's trying to decode the temperature data and it's just random data. So it's airing out, but you can see that it's hitting the endpoint every five seconds and receiving the data. And I think that's it. So that's our demo it actually worked. And you can see it's uh, gonna keep on transmitting until I shut it down. Uh, but that's uh, Lower Wan and using Python. Again, I'm in the, uh, go back to the first slide here. I'm Pizza Panther in the Slack and on Twitter. So if you have any questions uh, about this or about the job that I said uh, in the beginning of the presentation, uh, send me a message. Thanks.